So, next speaker is、uh, Mark Pasta from the Department of Energy, United States. So, his presentation title will be the、um, Energy Analysis. Good morning. It's a real privilege to be part of Eisner, and it's a great privilege to be able to talk to you this morning. I will, as has already been said, I will also be talking about the Eisner Energy Analysis Platform, and I hope to build on what you just heard from Dr. Honda. So, what's the purpose of the Energy Analysis Platform? There's three of them. We want to help ensure that the Eisner research is relevant. And what do we mean by that? We mean that we want Eisner to be working on the best options for low carbon energy for Japan. And to do that, Eisner needs to be informed about all of the relevant current and future energy options that are being developed elsewhere. And the third purpose is to help enable Eisner to have a vision for a low carbon energy infrastructure for Japan's future. There s three key elements to any energy analysis greenhouse gas emissions, energy efficiency, and cost. Eisner's program is dedicated to minimizing greenhouse gas emissions. But the systems it develops have to be energy efficient as well. And they have to have a reasonable cost for Japan to be able to compete in the world markets. Energy analysis also needs to be done on a well to wheel or cradle to grave basis. And what do I mean by that? Well, let's just take an energy pathway that you're all familiar with petroleum use in vehicles. Well, where does it start? It starts back. At the well, where you extract crude oil. That costs money, and that has emissions and energy associated with it. Then that crude needs to be delivered to a refinery. Then it's got to be reformed, either gasoline or diesel at that refinery. Then it's got to be delivered to a refueling station, and then finally utilized in the vehicle. To really understand the energy picture, you have to look at that entire pathway, and you have to look at all parts of that pathway. To understand where the greenhouse gas emissions, energy efficiencies, and costs are coming from, I've got two other pathways up here. One is near and dear to Eisner's heart, the second one we've already heard about it today, using sunlight and photocatalysts to split water. And when you do that, you still have to deliver hydrogen and use it in a fuel cell vehicle or produce power with it. Another one, natural gas. Again, you need to go all the way back to the natural gas wells. And in the case of Japan, those are located pretty far away from Japan. Extract the gas, deliver it, reform it to hydrogen, and then use it in a fuel cell to produce electricity or use it in a fuel cell vehicle. But these are all energy pathways. They have to be looked at from the starting point to the end point and all steps along the way to really understand them. Energy analysis also needs to include and account for、uh, the primary energy's availability and where it is. Oil and natural gas are finite resources, and unfortunately, Japan needs to import almost all that they use. Wind and solar are renewable, and they're relatively abundant. So, what approach will we take in this analysis platform? Well, I think it needs to be. Four tasks. They won't be run sequentially, they'll actually mostly occur actually simultaneously. And I'll talk more about each one as I proceed in the talk. First of all, we need to understand Japan's current energy picture. Where are we today? Secondly, we need to analyze all relevant linear, well to wheel, or cradle to grave energy pathways. And this task is going to be the primary and continuing focus of the analysis platform. It's the heart of the platform. We want to look at all of the Eisner energy pathways and technologies. And we want to look at other current and future energy pathways that are under development. And this will help ensure that Eisner's research is on the right path. And it'll help focus the Eisner research on the key issues along that pathway. Longer term, we'd like to develop what's called a dynamic energy macro system model for Japan. 
It would combine all the energy pathways in one dynamic interacting model, servicing all of the energy sectors based on demand over time. And an example of that is the U.S. National Energy Management System, better known as NEMS, if any of you are familiar with it. Through all of these tasks, we'll be trying to develop <clears throat> a possible low carbon energy vision or visions for Japan's future. Okay, so let's go back <clears throat> and look at these in more detail. First, the current energy picture in Japan. We need to understand total energy use. We need to understand that energy use by sector, industrial, commercial, residential, and transportation. We need to understand it by primary feedstock and process and full energy pathway. And again, here are examples of energy pathways. Coal and natural gas, you could use combustion, or you could use gasification or other technologies that was mentioned by Dr. Honda to produce electricity. The petroleum pathway we've already talked about for vehicles. There's a petroleum pathway where you refine the heating oil to generate heat. At any rate, we want to understand all of the energy pathways that are currently in use in Japan. What's the source of the primary energy feedstock? What exists in Japan today for infrastructure for both production and delivery? And understand the three key elements of each of those pathways. Cost, greenhouse gas emissions, and efficiency. That's the starting point. Here's a picture of what I'm talking about. It's actually for the US. It looks extremely complex, but stay with me. It's not quite that bad. It's a little bit dated, and I apologize for that. It's from 2001. The US uses about 100 quads of energy. A quad is a quadrillion BTUs. If you think in exajoules, it's about one quad equals about one exajoule. At any rate, think of the number of 100. Let's start down here in this green area. This is the petroleum energy pathways. The US produces about 15 quads of petroleum and imports about 25. Just a small amount of it in the US goes to electric power. A small amount of it actually gets exported, or at least it did in 2001. I'm not sure it does anymore. A small amount of it goes to residential and commercial for heat. A small amount of it goes to industrial and other non-fuel applications. But the bulk of it, 26 quads, is used in transportation. And embedded in here are all the processes along those energy pathways to produce, to get the crude out of the ground, to refine it to gasoline or diesel or jet fuel, to use it in vehicles, in different types of vehicles. And that's the petroleum feedstock pathways, and there's many of them. Note, you start with 26 quads. You actually only use five in the end. That's all that gets to the wheels of your car. It's not all that energy efficient with today's technology. Each color represents a different pathway. Black is coal, and the majority of it goes to electric power. This is natural gas. It's split up in a variety of ways, some to electric power, some for residential and commercial for heat, some to industrial. And the other pathways um, used in the US are on here as well. Nuclear, hydroelectric, biomass, and other renewables are all embedded in here. But that's just one energy picture. It's for the US. We need that energy picture for Japan to understand our starting point, and we need to know what the pathways are embedded behind this figure and what the costs, energy efficiencies, and emissions are today. The next task, again, is the most important task and the primary focus. It is analysis and comparison of Eisner's energy systems and pathways and compare them to existing and other new energy systems and pathways, all done, as we've talked about, on a well-to-wheel -well basis. Here's examples of the pathways that we want to look at. And this is a short list compared to the full list that we'd like to look at in the end. The top ones are all about vehicles. Here's the petroleum one we've talked about before, going to conventional vehicle. It can also go to a hybrid electric vehicle. Coal and natural gas to produce electricity with or without sequestration to all electric vehicles, another new technology being developed. Coal and natural gas to hydrogen with carbon sequestration in a fuel cell vehicle. 
the pro one of the primary pathways being researched in, in, in Eisner. Wind to electricity. Use the electricity to produce hydrogen by electrolysis in a fuel cell vehicle. And then the Eisner's sunlight path. Sunlight, water, photocatalyst. It really sounds good. It is, by the way. Just make it work, please. <coughs> um, to a fuel cell vehicle. And then these three are for power. That's just a short list. And one of our tasks in this analysis effort is what's the full scope? How many are we going to look at? We can't look at all of them, but we can look at all the ones that are relevant to Eisner in terms of what it needs to understand. We need to include both central and distributed production pathways, another facet of energy pathways. We need to include delivery, transmission, storage, and reflects Japan's need to import. We look, need to look at the current status of technologies, we need to project improvements in those technologies, improvements in current technologies, and then obviously the new technologies are still under development. And where might they get to in the end? So we have to look at this over time. There's a lot of tools available to do linear pathway analysis. First of all, there's lots of existing data, especially about what's going on today. And there's been a lot of analysis done on some of the new technologies being developed. But there'll be gaps, and we will have to develop some of our own models, certainly for some of the um, technology being developed in Eisner. And there are tools for that. There's modeling tools like Aspen, which does therm thermodynamic modeling and costing. And there's other tools available. We'll use GREET. GREET stands for Greenhouse Gases, Regulated Emissions, and Energy Use in Transportation. It was developed by the Argonne National Lab. It's open access. It's a huge database on greenhouse gas emissions on many, many energy pathways, both current technology and even some new technologies under development. It'll be extremely useful to us. Once we have a large number of these pathways analyzed, along with Eisner's energy pathways, this analysis will point to the better options and why. And most importantly, for the Eisner research, it'll point to the key parts of that technology that you need to focus on. And sometimes, that's not as obvious as you think it is. Through all of this, there'll be constant feedback to and from the Eisner researchers, research efforts to help ensure the research stays on track, is relevant, informed, and properly targeted. This just shows you some of the pathways in the GREET model. Now, I won't go through all of these, but you can see it starts, these are all for power or electricity. It starts with the primary energy feedstock, coal, natural gas, cellulose, biomass, nuclear, hydro, wind for renewables. It has multiple process technologies utilizing those feedstocks to get to power. And it also tracks the use of that in the applications. So it does, again, the complete well-to-wheel -well pathway, and it's already got a huge amounts of greenhouse gas emissions data on both current technologies used throughout the world and some new technologies. Similarly, similarly in GREET, it looks at the liquid fuel pathways for transportation, and I won't go through, through these in detail, but it's just an immense database. It's set up so that you can go into it and put different parts together and develop different pathways or look at different pathways and look at combinations of pathways to get the greenhouse gas emissions. Here's an example of linear energy pathway analysis. And this is a very recent analysis. It was funded by the DOE, hydrogen and fuel cell program, by the way. A lot of the data for this analysis, really almost all the data, came right out of GREET. And what's it looking at? Well, it's looking across a wide variety of different passenger vehicle technologies. Conventional vehicles, hybrids, plug-in hybrids, and near and dear to our heart, fuel cells. And it's looking at the primary energy source 
and the total pathway from that primary energy source through the vehicle itself, use of the vehicle, to get greenhouse gas emissions, and that's the horizontal axis, and it's on grams of CO2 equivalent per mile driven. So what do we have? Well, first of all, note that this is for 2020. So the people who did this study did project where these technologies will get to in 2020. They might be right, they might be wrong, but it's better than just looking at where it is today. Today, today's conventional gasoline internal combustion engine, um, it's 540 grams of CO2 equivalent per mile. By 2020, it's projected to get down to 410. If you use natural gas, but again, a combustion engine, you're down to 320. Now we get into the hybrids, gasoline down to 250, diesel 220, corn ethanol 190, but cellulosic, cellulosic ethanol all the way down to less than 65. That's actually a very good system right there. So what happens if you use electricity? And you use electricity to charge a battery to go the first 40 miles. These are called plug-in hybrids. Hopefully, most of you are at least somewhat familiar with what I'm talking about here. The rest of it uses a standard hybrid electric vehicle drivetrain. Well, gasoline, you're still at 240. You really know better than a straight hybrid. With cellulosic ethanol, you're worse than a straight hybrid. You're back up to 150. Well, why is that? Because you've used electricity from the electricity grid. And the electricity grid isn't very efficient and produces a lot of carbon. So some people think electric vehicles are the way of the future. They don't understand this. It gets you off petroleum, but it doesn't get you out of greenhouse gas emissions. So now if we go down to fuel cell vehicles, things continue, continue to get better. Hydrogen from distributed natural gas, you're down to 200. From coal with sequestration, you're down to 110, which is a pretty good system based on coal. From biomass gasification, these three are the best. Biomass gasification, less than 55. High temperature electrolysis using nuclear energy, 50. Hydrogen from central wind electrolysis, less than 40. These are, this is what we're looking for, right? Hopefully soon we'll be able to add sunlight, water splitting, and maybe it'll even be less than wind. But that system's a good system. And these systems need to compete against that system. I don't have time to dwell on this slide. I put it up here just to try to help you understand an interesting factor about hydrogen and fuel cell vehicles and their energy pathways. In this study, it's on hydrogen and fuel cell vehicles. The hydrogen's made the same way across this entire chart. Okay? These are pairs of cases. The smaller bars are greenhouse gas emissions. The taller bars are costs. In all cases, it was the same vehicle, drivetrain, same fuel cell. Hydrogen was produced the same way from natural gas reforming. The only difference is the storage system on board the vehicle. And we looked at 350 bar gas tanks, 700 bar gas tanks, cold hydrogen gas, because cold hydrogen has a higher density and you can get more in the vehicle. We looked at liquid hydrogen, and we looked at a metal organic framework absorption system, which also had to operate cold, so we had to liquefy the hydrogen. Just changing the storage technology changes the greenhouse gases and changes the cost. That's why you've got to do well to wheel analysis. Next subject is <clears throat> trying to model Japan's dynamic energy macro system, task three. Ideally, we'd look at all energy systems, processes, and all energy sectors, and they would all interact at once in this model over time. The model is given energy demand over time for each energy sector, and then it solves for a minimum. In most cases, it solves for a minimum cost. So it looks at what's the best mix of technologies to minimize cost for this demand for Japan or the US or whatever you're modeling. 
But you can also minimize greenhouse gas emissions, or you can maximize energy efficiency. You don't have to use the models to, just to come up with a minimum cost. It accounts for the time needed to install new facilities. It accounts for something very important that Dr. Honda talked about. It accounts for the fact that technology costs come down after, dramatically after they're first introduced as the volume of production goes up. It's a very important factor, and you'll see an example of that. It can account for government policy, and again, the U.S. NEMS model is an example. So why use one of these, and they are, I'll admit, very complex, integrated, dynamic macro system models when you can just look at the energy pathways like I just showed you? Well, here's why. Here's a great question. What's the best use of coal, natural gas, wind, and solar? You can try to answer that question looking at their in individual pathways. But what's the right mix? It's challenging because coal can be used to make electricity with or without carbon sequestration. It could be used to make hydrogen with carbon sequestration, go into a fuel cell to produce electricity, or you get the hydrogen out and you run a fuel cell vehicle on it. It's hard to figure out which way just to use that coal. But you could also use natural gas to get electricity in a solid oxide fuel cell to get electricity, or again, make hydrogen in a vehicle. Similar for wind, similar for sunlight. Lots of options, all of them are low carbon options. So what's the best mix? Dynamic energy macro systems can help you understand that. Here's just a quick schematic of the NEMS model in the US. It's got an oil supply module, natural gas, coal, renewable fuels. So these are all supply modules. And then it's got process modeling to take those um, and to generate electricity. And all the pathways you can go from there to electricity are in the model or to produce fuels for transportation. It's all integrated in this massive integrating module. Um, and it's driven by demands in the four sectors. So that's just a schematic if that helps you better understand what a macro system model is. It is hard to get your arms around it. Maybe these results will help, okay? So these are the types of results you can get from these types of models. This is not the NEMS model. This is actually the HITRANS model, which is another macro system model, but it's just for transportation. It doesn't concern itself with power, so um, it just looks at all the transportation options and it was developed by David Green at Oak Ridge National Lab. What we're looking at here is just three different vehicle technologies. Gasoline, conventional internal combustion engine, gasoline hybrid electric vehicle, and a hydrogen fuel cell vehicle. And we're looking at a time frame from 2000 to 2050. The results you get depend on the inputs you put in. Okay, So you can put in different inputs for how fast you think the costs of any of these technologies are going to come down or how fast their energy efficiency might go up because of research, okay? But you put in a set of assumptions about that and then you watch and see what happens with that particular set of assumptions. In this case, for the, the Green Lines fuel cells, we put in policy to get the fuel cell vehicle market started because fuel cell vehicles are very expensive when they're handmade one at a time. <laughs> But they get a lot cheaper when you're up to tens or 50,000 or 50, vehicles a year. So for the first 10 years of their introduction, they're heavily subsidized in this model by the federal government. From there, they're self-sustaining. So what does this picture show us? Well, it shows us that gasoline ICEs are going out, but it takes time. It doesn't happen instantaneously. Hybrids are coming in, and they're coming in strong. It's a better technology. It's more efficient. But then fuel cell vehicles come on the scene. And based on the set of inputs in this particular model, fuel cell vehicles, and this is all based on minimum cost in this run, fuel cell vehicles eventually dominate and are better than hybrids. But it doesn't happen instantaneously. That's the type of thing you can do with macro system models. OK, the last task is to look at potential energy visions for Japan from Eisner's perspective. We want, to look, we want to have different energy demand curves versus time by sector 
and energy type. Okay? There's many projections about what's going to happen in Japan. None of them are right. But they bracket what's probably going to happen one way or another. You don't look at one demand curve. You need to look at a spread of demand curves, but we will. We'll have an inventory of all possible energy sources, processes, and pathways, infrastructure, and architecture. We'll have current, and most importantly in this case, for visioning, projected greenhouse gas emissions, energy efficiencies, and costs for those pathways. And we can even include other possible energy breakthroughs, some of which, again, Dr. Honda talked about. Utilizing both the information from linear analysis and, in the end, from the macro system model, we can develop a vision for what techno mix of technologies looks right for Japan's future for a low carbon energy infrastructure. But it won't be one vision. We'll look at a number of different scenarios. We can modify the degrees of success of the research over time, look at different public policies, different world markets. But in total, we'll be able to put the energy needs and options in perspective. We'll be able to point to the better options and understand why. And we can highlight the critical aspects of any given energy pathway in terms of where Eisner could focus its research efforts. And this is all to help ensure that Eisner's research is relevant and well-targeted. <coughs> we don't want to reinvent the wheel. We're going to go out to every and all resources available to us. I mentioned a lot of models and a lot of data that already exists. We want to talk to the government agencies in Japan who certainly have a lot of information and knowledge and their own visions utilize universities around the world, national labs, research institutes. We want to talk to industry. They're the ones who really know what the costs and energy efficiencies are. Some might share some information with us, but at least we can take what we've developed and they can say, are you on track? Are we on track or off track with all of this analysis? And any other source we can find. So where are we? Hopefully what you've seen is at least the start of a plan, and we're just barely starting to execute. We need to finalize the scope, assemble a team, assess what information and analyses are already available, and from that, figure out how much work we really have to do, develop a detailed plan for all of those tasks and timing, and then execute it. Through all of this, even through the planning stages, we want to work closely with the Eisner researchers, and we want to help guide the development and execution of the total Eisner roadmap if we can add value to that. And thank you.